Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. Why, I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. But, but how did you know? Madam, as any horticulturist will tell you, one does not plant petunias until May is out. Take her away. Sorry, madam. It's just a matter of observation. The real question is how observant were you? Uh, action. Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. Why, I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. So, a quick show of hands. How many of you had seen this video before? Oh, three, four people, five maybe. How many of you got any of the changes? <laughs> three, four, five people. How many of you didn't get any? <laughs> okay. I rest my case, the whole room. It's fascinating, isn't it? Okay, also, erstmals möchte ich mich vielmals bei äh, Frankie und TCDM Berlin bedanken. Es ist eine sehr große Ehre für mich hier zu sein und äh, hoffentlich werdet ihr nachher nicht zu enttäuscht sein. And for those of you who didn't get that, it was just me sucking up to the German chapter. <laughs> okay, speaking of me, I'd like to point out that I am not a scholar, I'm not a scientist. I'm here to try to get your juices running. I'd like to present you with a lot of information that I hope that you'll pick up on and take to the next level. So if you think I'm full of shit, please go ahead, debunk me. I want you to do that. I want you to validate this in, uh, all this information that I'm about to share with you. Okay. Now, we're going to do a brief introduction of uh, neuroscience, if you will, uh, which is just kind of a few pointers about uh, the history. Um, many people think neuroscience is kind of a new field, a new topic. It's not really. I mean, people have been fascinated with the brain for thousands of years. So we find, for instance, uh, reports of the euphorian effect of poppy plant seeds in the old Sumerian records, and uh, many people will be familiar with Hippocrates, who uh, discussed epilepsy as a disturbance of the brain way back when. And back in the uh, scientific era, if you will, of the Muslim world in the year 900, Rasis describes seven cranial nerves and 31 spinal nerves in his medical work of the time called uh, Kitab al Hawi Fa al Tib, or something like that. I'm not <laughs> exactly sure how to pronounce that. Please don't hold that against me. Um, 1543, the Dutchman Andreas Vesalius uh, uh, posts his work called On the Fabric of the Human Body and uh, gives the fullest account of the brain anatomy to that time. He got a lot of stuff wrong, but he got an impressive amount actually correct. Fast forward a little bit, uh, can't really talk about science without mentioning this guy. 1859, uh, Darwin comes, around, uh, comes along and shakes up the whole uh, scientific process from then. Um, moving along, in the year 1900, Sigmund Freud uh, comes along and tips the boat again, if you will, introducing what is effectively the uh, uh, um, uh, field of psychology, which is still debated today. And, um, of course, uh, bringing it a little closer to home, in the 1970s, uh, Benjamin Libet at the University of California did a series of studies that uh, basically shows that the brain is engaged in decision-making activity long before we're actually aware of it. And this is, of course, very controversial stuff, and he's been heavily debated. Uh, one of his uh, most verbal critics is uh, Daniel Dennett, who is in his own right a really great guy. I recommend his uh, work here. He is a um, cognitive scientist and philosopher, and he's got a great book, uh, Consciousness Explained, which I heartily recommend. 
And this guy will be familiar to a lot of you. Peter just mentioned him, uh, one of my favorite uh, scientists and science, um, uh, how do you say that, uh, communicators. Um, I like his work because he's a very good at uh, understanding how these causalities work, and he's very good at describing to the rest of us who don't understand any of this stuff how it works. So I really recommend his stuff. And you know, these implications have far further reaches than we than we tend to think on a on a normal average uh, level. So uh, here he is in a small clip with uh, Alan Elder discussing the justice system. So, what do you see as the the contribution of neuroscience at some point to the justice system. Does it, does it start in the courtroom or should it start all the way at the beginning, reframing our laws? Well, you know, we professor types state things in these very cautious, qualified ways. So I'll, I'll do that here and just say, the whole system has to go. The modern criminal justice system is incompatible with neuroscience. It simply is not possible to have the two of them in the same room. Well, he said it, must be true. <laughs> well, actually, uh, there is uh, more uh, evidence to support this claim. It's not just taken out of thin air. Right here in Berlin, you have something called the Computational Neuroscience Center in Berlin. And this is uh, John Dylan Haynes, who is the leader of the theory of, uh, and analysis of large-scale brain signals. And I think the way that he summarizes it just says it all. Decisions don't come from nowhere, but they emerge from prior brain activity. Where else should they come from? In theory, it might be possible to trace the causal pathway of a decision all the way back to the Big Bang. Our research shows that we can trace it back about 10 seconds. And then with some kind of usual scientific uh, humility, he goes on to state that, you know, compared to the time since the Big Bang, that's not very long. I mean, <laughs> he's completely just, you know, validated all that Benjamin Libet did previous, so this is interesting. Okay, so where, where does that leave us today? Um, it leaves us with a range of different kind of neuro stuff to look through. We've got you know, neuroendocrinology, neurobiology, which is kind of the hands-on stuff. Then you've got neuropsychiatry, the pathology of it all. You've got neuropsychology, you know, let's talk about it. And then you have a neurophilosophy, it's like, what's it, what's it all about? And then, of course, you have a lot of neurobollocks, which you could call it. <laughs> There's a lot of interesting, interesting information floating around out there. Now, how many of you are familiar with this statement? Yeah, oh, about half the room. How many of you believe it to be true? Ah, not very many. Thank God, you're on the right path here, people. That's good. <laughs> okay. Well, in the words of Barry Gordon at the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine, it turns out that we use virtually every part of the brain and that the brain is active almost all of the time. Let's put it this way. The brain represents 3% of the body's weight and uses 20% of the body's energy. And then he goes on to state, um, uh, ultimately, it's not that we use 10% of our brains, merely that we understand about 10% of how it functions. So if you're going to go with that 10% number, use that one. It's much more accurate, okay? There's another great guy I want to recommend to you. His name is Christian Jarrett. He's a young British uh, scientist, cognitive neuroscientist. Uh, he's a science writer. He's got a great blog. By the way, all these links are available to you. I've got a PDF with all of the stuff in it. So if you want it, it's going to be in the video uh, link uh, later on. But, uh, I mean, he's got a great book, Great Myths of the Mind, um, or of the Brain. And uh, he's, among his peers, he's, uh, he's, he's really well respected for really grasping what this stuff is all about. Okay, so let's move into some practical stuff here. This is what I like to call your unreliable brain. Now, your brain is hit with approximately 400 billion bits of information per second. You have about 100 billion brain cells about 10,000 neuronal connections connect each of these, and you have about one trillion interactions going on in your brain per second. 2,000 of these can reach your immediate consciousness, and seven of these can reach your immediate memory, one of which you can actually react upon. So these are the odds, people. <laughs> that's, that's what you're up against, okay? Now, let's, I'm going to do some simple experiments here. It's not going to be visible to everybody, but this is known as selective perception. And uh, here are a couple of visual examples of that. I realize because of the size of the room, many of you are probably not going to uh, perceive this, but, I mean, go, go home and check it out later on if you haven't already. 
Now, this first one is known as the Ebbinghaus illusion. And as you stare at this image, you're probably going to feel a little bit queasy because it kind of feels like it's wobbling all around. Of course, it's doing no such thing. But your brain is telling you that it is. Uh, this next one is uh, the Hermann grid. And as you stare at this, you're going to see uh, strange little gray dots appear in the cross-sections of this image. And uh, of course, there's no such thing as a gray dot in sight, but your brain tells you that there, there is. We've got these uh, ambiguous images. These go way back uh, several centuries. And uh, some of you might be seeing a young girl with her head turned, uh, looking to the back of the room. Others of you might see an old lady looking slightly to the left, to the front of the room. And to help you a little bit, here is uh, the young girl. You can kind of see her eyelash, a tiny little nose and chin there with her scarf. And those of you who see the old lady, you're going to see two eyes facing the front with what was a chin before is now the nose. And the small nose is now a big wart on that. <laughs> you know. So these are interesting, interesting images. Next are these uh, physiological is illusions, which are really f uh, funny. The, uh, um, uh, Swiss artist MC Escher did a lot to popularize these back in the 80s. These are kind of impossible um, 3D images and, of course, the impossible cube. Some of you might be familiar with this. And, um, and then you have the trickery of light. Most will agree that the tile here marked with an A is visibly darker than the tile marked with a B, but as, as you see when you connect them, they are in fact the same color. And uh, this is a trickery of light. And uh, speaking of trickery of light, have, does anyone remember this one? <laughs> a couple of weeks back, th this went viral all over the world. This is from the Danish media. It was on the TV. It was in every newspaper. And, of course, it's the infamous dress syndrome. Here is the infamous dress. Actually, there is a, both a blue and a white version. <laughs> but it all began with uh, this guy, one of my other favorite people on the planet, Dr. Neil deGrasse, deGrasse Tyson, who is, of course, the theoretical ast astrophysicist and the director of the Hayden Planetarium in New York, a great science communicator. And uh, he tweeted this the other day in relation to this image. Um, if we were honest about uh, the shortcomings of human physiology, then optical illusions would instead be labeled brain failures. And I think this it says a lot. We think it's kind of quaint and funny and all that, but it's really stopping us from understanding what's going on around us. And speaking of understanding what's going on around us, has anyone noticed anything about this slide? You know, use your perceptive powers. The comment, right. What's that all about? <laughs> you know, I swear I wasn't looking for it. I just went to the original tweet and that was the first comment made in that section. And I thought to myself, oh my God, we've got a long way to go. I mean, that's... Well, okay, so just break it down a little bit. I'm not going to take you through the whole physiology of it all, but this is a cross-section of the human eye. I'm going to explain a little bit of what's going on. You've got something called the fovea, which is like the focal point of the eye. What you have here is a graphic representation of the human left eye. On the y-axis, you have the distance uh, away from the eye. On the x-axis, you can see your visual acuity kind of dropping uh, to either side. What's happening here is the brain can only uh, focus on one thing at a time, so it kind of makes up stuff all the time. So that's why you get this wobbling effect and the gray dots appearing on all that. So your brain isn't really reliable at all. Another way to look at it, the light spectrum is completely immense, but yet the human vis visual uh, um, capacity is only between 400 and 700 nanometers. So on the, on the short wavelengths, we've got stuff like deadly gamma rays and X-rays that we cannot perceive until it's way too late and we're dying of cancer, uh, you know, <laughs> a huge amount of pain. And the same thing goes on the longer uh, side of the spectrum. You've got uh, stuff like microwaves. We can't perceive radio waves or broadcast band widths at all. So we're really rather limited here. Okay, jumping forward a little bit. There's a great website out there that I really recommend. It's called ASAP Science. They've got a YouTube channel with a lot of great videos explaining a lot of this physiological uh, phenomenon. So I really recommend that. I'm just going to do a few here because I think they're really interesting. This one is called the McGurk effect. And it is uh, the uh, effect of a perceptual phenomenon that demonstrates an interaction between hearing and vision in speech perception. And instead of just, you know, mumbling all about that, I'm going to play it to you. Listen to Greg speaking. Bar, 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 bar. What do you hear? If you heard bar, 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 you'd be right. But how about now? Bar, 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 bar. Bar, bar. 
Chances are you heard far, far, far this time with an F. Except you didn't. In fact, the audio didn't even change between the two videos. Far, far, far. Strange as it may seem, what you hear depends on which video you're looking at. Go ahead, take turns watching each video and see how the sound morphs. Far, far, far. This is a perfect example of something called the McGurk effect, which shows how our visuals can alter what we believe we're hearing. Fascinating, isn't it? <laughs> Yeah. Right, here's another one um, that I totally love. I'm not going to even bother explaining it because it's going to sound completely like mumbo jumbo, but you're going to get it once you actually hear what's going on. Check this out. Listen to this audio clip of a gradually climbing tune. <laughs> And yet, if I play the exact same clip back to you, it will sound like it's only continuing to climb higher and higher. I swear this is the exact same clip I just played. You can rewind that section of this video over and over and check for yourself. Try it. Each time you start it over, the tune is seemingly climbing even higher. It's called the shepherd tone illusion, of which there are many variations. It's true. I mean, you have to have a long time pass and do other stuff before you can actually reset that effect, so... Be careful what you trust when you hear stuff. Okay, just a little bit of fun facts about the human auditory system. If you look at other animals, elephants have been reported to be able to hear as low as 5 hertz, actually, even it's not on this graph. Mice can hear upwards of 100,000 cycles per second, and dolphins up to as much as 200,000. Now, humans, we're here. We're between 20 and 20,000, most a little less, and it'll actually decline as you get older all the time. So we can't hear what's going on around us either. Okay, I'm just going to tie this into a little bit deeper topic, something known as cognitive dissonance. And I'm not going to go into it too much, just to present you with a guy who actually coined the term and recommend you the book, which is fantastic, Dr. Leon Festinger. And uh, he also has a great quote, I think, just kind of summarizing his work, which is, I, ref I prefer to rely on my memory. I have lived with that memory a long time. I'm used to it. And if I have rearranged or distorted anything, surely that was done for my own benefit. That kind of <laughs> summarizes that whole thing. That's how we feel about ourselves and how we feel about our way of perceiving things, but it's very far from the truth. Okay, to wrap things up, how does this apply to TZM or anyone? Well, I think it applies in major, major, huge ways, actually, because what are we? Well, we're a social movement. What does that entail? It entails social interaction. And if you don't understand your own perceptions, you have no chance of understanding everybody else's perceptions. So, of course, it's about communication. And you need to understand what communication is, how that in, what that entails, and that begins by understanding how your brain functions. Also, of course, we're global in scope. We want to transcend borders. We want to uh, break down the artificial borders that separate people, whether they're racial or sexual or national or whatever. And in order to do that, we have to really understand what's going on on a, on a cognitive level, if you will. And even though it's global, top-down in that sense, it starts with you. Each and every one of you have to improve in order to improve on the rest of stuff. So I'm going to give you some, some recommendations here. Uh, Lumosity.com is a great training website. It's not free, but it's a very, very well-sourced and very scientific way of training different areas of how your brain works, and I recommend it to anyone. It's just a small series of games. You spend five, ten minutes on it every day, and you actually improve on a lot of, a lot of areas. Um, next, I also want to point out that most of the American and European universities are now putting their curriculum out there for free at places like iTunes U, other places. You can find most of what's out there absolutely free, and you can follow any course, and some of them you can even take a degree just by watching that. It's not the same merit as actually going to the school, but, I mean, the info is out there. And again, I would recommend Sapolsky's work on human nature, if you will, <laughs> because that's really mind-opening. Also, uh, there's a great YouTube channel called uh, Theremin Trees. Some of you may be aware of this. Uh, he's got a great series of what's known as transactional analysis, which is a very good way of looking at conversational techniques and how you can find yourself in a loop, not getting anywhere, and how to get out of that. It's, it's very easy to understand and apply. So, you know, I've been with the movement now for a better part of six years anyway, and 
I've come to learn that patience really is not a virtue, it is a necessity, because it's hard work. As Gilbert said, you know, you, you kind of expect coming in, changing the world tomorrow, doesn't work that, like that. So I'm just going to leave you with a little afterthought here. If you improve upon yourself, you can't help improving upon the world in the process. So thank you very much.